This is Deep Natter, and in this episode, I'm joined by large format landscape photographer Ben Horn, and we're talking about some of the challenges and considerations around creating products for an audience and why print still and maybe always will be better than looking at work on a screen. Here we go. Thank you so much for being willing to take some time. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I have uh, I have plenty of time these days. So that's <laughs> <laughs> at least that's how it seems, right? Well, it, it's a great time of year, too, because this is when you and, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because this is when you put out your box set. And yeah. Sean and I have been talking a lot about print and print projects that we're both kind of trying to sort out. And I've been following a lot of what Dan, Mil you know, Dan Milner from Blurb. No, I don't. Daniel Milner is somebody that you should uh, follow and check out. He's fantastic, huge advocate of print. And uh, he's, I, I guess, I don't even know what his job title is at Blurb. I think it's platform evangelist or or company. Of, I, I don't know what actually what his job is. Uh, uh -huh. But he drives around in his van and takes pictures and makes films and answers questions. And he's just such an interesting guy. But he is... 100% uh, all in on print. And in fact, when he when he goes out to do a job, he will bring these field guides with him. So when people ask him, so what do you do? Rather than pulling out his phone or, or a tablet or something, yeah. he can hand them a book and go, this is what I do. And wow. has spoken really candidly and eloquently about the power that that has relative to just Oh, let me just look at my Squarespace site, you know, or let me just, yeah. let me just look at my Flickr portfolio, whatever it is, you know, that there is something more visceral, even for a potential client or customer about print. And I know you feel the same way about print, that there is power in print, that there is substance in print that you don't get online. So that's kind of what I wanted to, if we could talk a little bit about that and how and, and to what degree you bring that energy to your print collection every year. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like just when you're talking about, you know, just handing over the phone, you know, Hey, this is what I do. There's nothing worse than that. I mean, like it, as soon as the phone comes out, it, it's, it's never, nothing ever comes across great that way. Right. Whether it's, you know, someone showing a video or showing pictures, it's just, it, it's gotta be among the worst ways to actually show, you know, someone your work. So I could definitely see how having something that is printed to hand a person, um, that, that goes a really long way. Mm -hmm. And, and the whole thing about the, um, the print portfolios is for, for me, at least it gives me a deadline. It gives me, um, like basically kind of a, a quota hit to hit for the year. So for me, it's just as important for my own development as an artist because it gives some degree of structure, mm -hmm. um, but but also to be able to share the work that way, where it's tangible, where people can look at the prints as they're meant to be seen, as opposed to you know something small on a phone or perhaps even worse, you know, a picture in a, a video that a person's going to watch on their yeah, phone. Yeah, right, right. You know, so so I I've I've really come to embrace the idea of print, but also I'm a bit of a control freak. So being able to control the entire process and, you know, look at each individual print that goes out and like sign off on each one and, and make sure everything fits together really nicely. Um, that's something that I also do enjoy about the process, but man, it is, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to put them together. Yeah. Do, do you think your audience has always appreciated the effort that you put in or have you had to almost earn that appreciation on the back of continuing to put them out? I think just from the nature of shooting film um, and especially with large format where everything is just slow, measured out, just very deliberate. Mm -hmm. I think that that, that sense has always been there where yeah. it's j just in the way that we, you know, it's human nature to appreciate the things that you have less of. Um, and so, you know, the media, you know, right off the bat, you know, limiting the number of photos taken, it, it seems to elevate that photo just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, 
just from the standpoint that more more thought and effort goes into it. And I, I think that that translates well to a printed format. Um, and kind, kind of, I guess, in, in the same way that, you know, when I'm handling the original transparencies and I'm looking at them on the light box and just looking at that as like, the, you know, that's the fruits of the labor of going out and, you know, spending all the nights out the field and hiking and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then to actually have that physical product to get at the end of it, I think that's also a part of it where, you know, for those that do follow the videos and kind of understand a bit more of the story behind the images, um, that, you know, there's something tangible at the end to, to hold on to and to feel. And I also, I, one of my favorite classes in college was a, a bookmaking class. I don't know if you've ever taken any, oh, wow. any classes no, I haven't. along those lines. And it it was, it was really fascinating because, you know, we had these projects that we were working on where it was different styles of binding. You put it together and, and by the end, we were actually putting the content within some of the books. But a lot of it was about the materials, about the technique. And I took it for just um, one, I took just one semester of it. Um, my wife, I think she took at least two, possibly three semesters. So she got wow. even more involved with it. But I really gained an appreciation for different materials and, and technique. Um, so when I do the um, the portfolios, they're really rich with the texture. Like I, mm. I'm really drawn to that just to add to that tactile feeling to in some ways give a somewhat similar experience to looking at the film in person, you know, as far as just making it a very tactile experience. Right. And and for those of you who I, I should have mentioned this earlier, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Ben's work, Ben shoots large format film and I have never shot large format film. I have witnessed and been with photographers who have shot it, but I've not done it myself, but it is a completely different experience. And when you get these massive and they are massive transparencies, that's got to be an incredible feeling when you first see them. Yes. Oh, well, Sometimes <laughs> if, if, if everything works out right, if everything is four out of 10, it's a great experience. <laughs> yeah, somewhere there. It, it's a love hate relationship. I mean, yeah, it'll be about a week after I come back from a trip that I review the film. And so I record these film reveal videos where I take a look at the, for the, at the film for the first time on camera and just, I do it mostly for myself so I can sort of record that experience and in, in my initial thought to it. But I'll say that most of the time, Right away, I'm not in love with the images. Really? Um, just because it, it's so fresh in my mind, how it actually looked. And so when I look at them, usually if I go, if I do a film reveal and I look at all my film and I'm really excited about the images, those images are typically going to start like, it, it's almost like a little time passes. I start falling out of love with them and I start realizing <laughs> that they're, there's so, stuff with those images where I'm just, it's these glaring things I just, I can't not see anymore. Um, but if my first reaction when I see the film is a bit uh, kind of um, not really sure what to think, yeah, that's actually usually a sign that it's a pretty strong set because those images will grow on me as right. I, as I kind of learn. Um, but yeah, if, if I do have a photo, especially one that I'm looking back at as taken maybe a few years ago, one that I've come to realize is an image I really like. Man, the experience of looking at that on a ground glass, not on a ground glass, but on, on a light box with a loop, mm -hmm. it's it, it tricks your brain into thinking you're looking at reality. Um, wow. And that's that's one of the reasons I really do uh, enjoy the whole process behind it. And it's also why I love doing prints because it's kind of like the second best way of getting that experience. It's better than what you get on a computer screen. Right. Um, there's right. Just so, more, so much more nuance to it. How has your criticism of your work evolved or changed over the years since you first started shooting? Um, I've always been my worst critic. Yeah. Um, and I'll say that I, I think I've always been pretty equally critical of the work, but I would say that in the past, I don't know, maybe five years or so, um, I've gotten to the point where not only am I critical of it, but I can find ways of making it work a bit better. Whereas 
in the past, there might be an image where I just, I can't stand to look at it, which it's, it's a strange thing to say, you know, if you, you know, spend a lot of time with a subject out in nature and wait for the moment to be just right and, and expose the film, everything is perfect and conditions are great. And then you look at that picture and you're like, oh, I hate it. <laughs> uh, but I think now I have a better feeling as to why it is that I don't like it. And it's oftentimes something very small something very subtle and something that can be tweaked just a little bit mm -hmm. to alleviate that. Um, so I think I've always been a pretty strong critic of my own work, but I think I've developed a tool set over the past, you know, five years or so right. that allows me to figure out what it is I don't like about something and the ways and, and sometimes it's something very subtle, um, but something to resolve whatever that point of conflict is uh, with the work as I see it. it. Is it always an issue with the image? Is it always an issue with the picture or, or is it an issue with how you made the picture? Does, does that play into it at all? What it took to get the picture kind of spilling over into the result or is it always just the image and the image alone? I think it's just the image by itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so I, I think as we, as we learn and grow as artists, we, we develop a, a larger tool set in order to, um, produce the sort of work that we're satisfied with. And, and it, it seems like it's like those, those tools become so much finer and so much more nuanced with time. And you realize that, you know, it takes just like the, the smallest of, of, uh, of change in order to bring out that image. Um, like, like for me, one of the biggest struggles I have with my own photography is if, if there's a subject that, that really draws me in for whatever reason, usually my goal is to represent that subject quite faithfully in the final photo. And it's quite difficult to represent that photo, that subject as it is in a way that evokes that same emotion, that same feeling, and just to try to make it look as normal and natural as possible. Um, so I think it's kind of the more subtle and nuanced stuff that we learn as we, you know, continue to, to develop as artists. And so I, I think that's, if I look at my work now, it's a lot more subtle than it used to be mm. um, in terms of subjects and in terms of just, just trying to make it look like it was for right, the most part, right, right, which right. is impossible. But if it's too glaringly far off, then in, to me, that just looks like a distraction. Yeah. Would you have even recognized five years ago the things that bother you now? Or have they become so subtle that your, your, your five-year previous self wouldn't have even caught them? Um, I would have known that something was off, but I, I probably wouldn't be able to put my, my finger on it. And yeah. it, it could be something very simple. Like there was this photo I shot on a spring backpacking trip and it was this, um, this really cool looking juniper tree and it's up against the sandstone wall. And there's like a, just a little bit of soil in that area and some desert plants. So it's like this little Zen garden with this juniper and it's in very soft light and, when I looked at the original film, I was happy with it, but there was something about the image that just wasn't very well balanced and I couldn't quite figure out what it was. And so I start to have this feeling of like, oh no, I was happy with this image. I'm going to start falling out of love with it. There's going to be something I can't overlook. But it turns out there's like this one little rock on the right side that was just a little on the bright side. It was perfectly exposed. Everything was fine, but it just, it was bright and it just attracted a little bit of attention. And I just selectively went in with uh, curves and just a mask and just kind of toned down that area just a little bit. And mm. then all of a sudden the image clicked and I was happy with it. So it's just like mm. one little thing like that, that I don't know that I would have recognized as the source of the conflict, you know, five years ago. Yeah. But now I know it's, it was just something as simple as that. Will you ever move or remove an object from a scene or is it always as captured? Uh, like in terms of like in-person moving something? 
or uh, on a computer? Uh, your choice, either in person or in post. Like if that rock just really wasn't working for you, do you write that image off because of it? Or do you go, you know what? This one time, I'm just going to clone stamp this out. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do some edits on the computer to, to make it work. Mm. Um, and usually it's something, uh, something that I, I call uh, octopus editing where if there's something that just doesn't look quite right, you can do a lot with the curves tool. And if you just make it blend in, it's all good. Uh, why why was, octopus uh, editing? Where did that come from? Imagine the camouflage of an octopus, right? <laughs> so like- Okay, so I was going in. another direction. I was, I was having like, you know, Wacom stylus in all eight <laughs> appendages oh. <laughs> just going to town on this image. Oh, I, I, could, I could see that. I could see that. But it, it, in this case, like there was a, a photo I have of this um, long flattened grass I took last fall in Zion. And in the lower left corner, there is a, a few yellow leaves there. Um, and then it, it was just kind of near the corner is drawing the attention. So I just went in with uh, the curves tool and with a mask and basically darkened them a little bit and then made them more of a green color as opposed to yellow. Mm, because mm -hmm. there were some other fallen leaves in the scene that were also green and you just make them blend in with everything else and your eye isn't attracted to them anymore um and so it's it just requires a very very particular mask um but with, with all the photography stuff i mean there's no perfect solution for this stuff there's no perfect image um so my philosophy is just trying to minimize any sort of distractions that uh, interfere with what it is I'm trying to convey with that photo from an artistic standpoint. Um, and then when it comes to like in-person stuff, so long as it's something that doesn't actually harm the scene, mm -hmm. like if I recognize that there's um, like a branch sticking into the scene I don't like, I might take that branch and just kind of like, I kind of hold it up against another branch so it doesn't like swing into the view. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not, you know, in, in the actual scene getting in the way, then when I'm done, I'll re release the branch back to where it was. So I right. have no problem doing that kind of stuff either. Right, 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 right. So it looks like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like you've done, you've made a little shift in the offering in terms of how you're presenting it this year. It looks yeah. like it's either, is it a different kind of folio? Is it just a thinner box? It's hard to tell from, from the photograph. I love that you still have the same belly band, so it's still the same aesthetic. But yeah. uh, can you talk about some of the changes? What's what's going on this year as opposed to previous years? Yeah, so I decided to go with a, it's a black paper folio uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to a box. So since 2017, so 2017 through 2021, um, I had these uh, heavy duty um, archival boxes that were, they're made by print file. And it's the same box as I store my, um, my exposed film in when I, you know, I'm done shooting. I'm just storing it there. Um, and so I use those boxes for a long time and they work great. Um, but I've been looking for a more streamlined setup uh, in a way that uh, a lot of people are putting these on a bookshelf and these boxes start taking up a lot of space. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. So I was looking for a, a folio design and rather than doing something, I go out to some company and have them make, I'm like, there's gotta be some company out there that makes a pre-made solution I can just order off the shelf. And um, I found a really good uh, solution. Um, back when I used to work at a camera store, uh, there was a company that we carried these um, these paper frames from. They're made for like event stuff. And and the company is called TAP, T-A-P. Um, they were purchased by a company called Tyndale. Um, they're located over... I don't know if they're like Minnesota or so, somewhere over in, in those parts of the country. Um, but they make these folios for, uh, for imagine like a wedding photographer presenting the images to the client, just kind of a nice mm -hmm. way of mm -hmm. presenting it. Mm -hmm. And so I ordered a couple different types from them and then some other companies as well. But I really liked the folios that this company made really nice texture, which matches the theme of what I'm going for really crisp edges. And I ordered uh, two boxes of a hundred each. So I got two hundred of these, and and they, the two hundred of them fit in like these small boxes. And if I compare that to those big um, boxes I was using for the box sets in the past, 
Right. You know, if I had 200 of those sitting around, they take up an enormous amount of space. Yeah. And each one of them came shrink wrapped and they kind of had to so that they didn't get destroyed in shipping. So that was a lot of plastic waste right off the bat. And mm-hmm. then to ship those all the way across the country with these three, like three or four huge boxes that you could like crawl inside if you wanted to. <laughs> so <Right. laughs> I'm just thinking like ways to minimize my own environmental impact of um, staying away from any sort of plastic, taking in mind uh, shipping costs, uh, materials. So uh, that was most of the driving force behind using the folios is to yeah. minimize my own impact. I love it. Um, and it yeah, fits and, so and, well with, with the rest of your approach to making pictures. It really does. Yeah. It, 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 and also it's a benefit to the customer because as a result, my shipping costs are quite a bit less now because mm-hmm. it was costing about $40 to ship the really? box that's international. Wow. And now it's around 26 or so. So wow. that's something I can just pass on to the customers. So they end up paying a little bit less in a time when everything else seems to be getting more expensive these days. Are you able to ship these in padded envelopes or do these go in a, a hard sided box? Uh, so I have some, uh, it's like a cardboard folding mailer um, mm. and I'm going to have two of them. So basically one is just a little bit bigger than the print portfolio and mm-hmm. then the other one's a 12 inch by 12 inch. Um, and so by having the two of them, the corners will be protected and then I'll have it wrapped in some, uh, tissue paper on the inside as opposed to plastic. Um, right. and that way everything that ships out in terms of packaging, it's all completely recyclable, um, which is the other thing in terms of just making sure I have a minimal impact with, you know, by doing this project. Yeah, I, I love it. I, I noticed it the other day and I was like, Hmm, that's there's, I, I can't wait to hear the story about this because I, and now hearing it, it's so, like I said, it so fits with with the rest of your sort of ethos and how you approach making pictures and and being respectful of the environment and being respectful of the locations. It just, it, man, it all works. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where, you know, it's, if you look at everything going on in the world with, you know, climate change and then just the enormous amounts of trash, and I got to say, it's, it's, quite intimidating just looking at all the issues that are out there. Mm -hmm. Um, But then realizing that there are some things we can do that do help a little bit with that. Yeah. Um, And so that's, that's been one of the things. And the other thing too is, um, I mean, at some point I do want to do another book, but at the same time, you kind of start to wonder about, you know, the impact of something along those lines. Right. And, you know, everything with that. So uh, I do like the idea of ebooks, electronic um, products where there's no shipping involved Mm -hmm. um, and other things along those lines. But yeah, (laughs) I've I've moved, I would say, maybe 85 to even 90 percent of of my reading books like fiction, nonfiction, that kind of thing to Mm -hmm. either EPUB or PDF, um, either through Libby or through, you know, Apple books or, or whatever. I listen to a lot of audio books, art and photo books. I still buy physical copies. Yeah. And even that though, I find that, and I, I said something about this in a recent iteration where I, after the first week or two, I rarely take them off the shelves again. I I like the fact that I can, if I want to, but the reality is, man, I've got a lot of books that never see the light of day and haven't seen the light of day for years. Yeah, it's it, it's it's fascinating, isn't it? Because I, I mean, if I look at you know many of the books that I have sitting on my shelf, you know that's that's part. I mean, it's it's I don't know how you get around that, mm-hmm. but there's something about that presentation of you know flipping through them and seeing the work as it's it's meant to be seen. But then they just kind of live on a bookshelf for the rest of their life. I mean, I'll as 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 a full disclosure, as I'm recording this right now, I have my uh, my microphone little housing with the foam and stuff. It's propped up on two photo books. As, as I'm recording this <laughs> so you, you are using them. <laughs> I, I am. I am. But they're, they're, they're books that were uh, gifted to me by a photographer friend of mine who he also has an enormous collection of books and he'll just send out books to, to friends every now and then, which is uh, a pretty nice solution where that it can continue to be, you know, used, whether it's, 
you know, propping up, uh, you know, a mic for a podcast <laughs> or, <laughs> or, you know, to be enjoyed, which I already have. Right, enjoyed. right. Um, but it does make you kind of wonder if there's some sort of market for like a, I don't know, moving along books so that other people can enjoy them in some way kind of gets mm-hmm. me thinking about that, you know? Yeah. We've got a little, uh, one of the little free libraries up the street. And, you know, it's nice because I can go grab a physical copy of a book. I can read it and I can put it back. Or I've, I've taken some books that, uh, fiction and nonfiction books out of my own collection and put them up there. And I, I love that. I don't know that that would be a solution for art and photo books just because I think there's such a specialized market. It is. R- relative to fiction, at least. And they're massive. I mean, I I can't put oh, yeah. a copy of Magnum contact sheets in a little free library. <laughs> the thing would fall to the ground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, and also, you know, we reached a point now where it's so much more feasible for a artist to self-publish their own book. Yeah. Whereas in, in the past, there are so many barriers in the way. So, I mean, these collections are only going to start growing more and more. I, I do know that whenever there is a you know, a photographer in the various circles that I follow for, for landscape photography, if they come out with a book, I mean, I'm, I'm reaching for that, you know, that order button right away. Mm -hmm. Um, But it does, it does make you wonder about sort of the, the long-term you know, what's, yeah, it's, there's, there's gotta be some, some way of, of putting them to, to good use, or at least a way of, you know, reminding us to pull them out and to, to enjoy them as they're meant to be enjoyed. Right. Right. You know, a lot more photographers than I do. It has the, and and you mentioned something just a minute ago about self-publishing has the, the prestige or the cachet, if you will, of, of having a publisher behind the book, has that largely faded in art and photo books, do you think? Or is there still value in having, you know, Abrams or, or whoever publish your book? I guess it really just, depends on the situation because in most cases of the books that I've purchased, they've been editions of maybe around a thousand or so, mm. um, which is enough so that it's, you're from what I understand, that's like a, you know, a pallet load of books. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a lot of books, maybe a couple of pallets, but it's, it's a lot of books, but at the same time, it is something that is manageable for the photographer to handle shipping out the orders and everything else. And, you know, they're putting all that, that hard work and they're putting the sweat into it and, and, and everything in order to send out the orders. But I think once you start getting to a wider publication of a book, that's got to hold a whole different level. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because at that point, it's not really going to be in the hands of the artist anymore. Um, They will, perhaps earn a fair amount more from it. Um, but also, you know, that, that book is going to be shaped based on all those middlemen in between right? in terms of the publisher and this and that. And so you get to wonder also if it's going to morph into something, you know, that is not quite what the original artist completely had in mind if they had complete control over the process. Right. Um, and I, I don't really know, of anyone who has produced books at that level. Most of the ones that I've, that I know of, or the ones I've bought, you know, it's been maybe in a a edition of a thousand or so, where it's a more manageable size where the artist has the, the complete control over the whole process. And, and also I'd imagine that there's been some changes in the technology that make it more feasible to produce some of the smaller editions. And, And perhaps that's one of the things that, is the reason why we've seen more of the books uh, lately from individual artists. Uh, Are you familiar with uh, Andrew Barufi's work? No. So he's a very, very talented photographer. He's living in New York right now, but he um, he's originally from the lived not too far from, from Zion and took a lot of work there, but he produced a book recently called heal and really, really fantastic book. Um, It's as much about, the words as it is about the images. Um, and so his book, um, he worked with a, um, independent, uh, publisher 
And so the, basically it was printed in, I believe, South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, but but there was, uh, I was speaking with the owner and he's talking about how there are some processes that are at play now to make photos display extremely well. Um, in terms of, you know, really good detail in the shadows and everything else and in areas where traditional printing usually falls short, of, you know, traditional offset printing. And so there, I know that there have been some advances in, in printing lately. So perhaps that's also one of the reasons why some of the smaller edition stuff is more feasible now than in the past. It's, you know, perhaps uh, it lowered prices of production or stuff along mm -hmm. those lines. Mm -hmm. When you think about doing a book yourself, are you thinking self-publishing? Are you thinking approaching a publisher? Have you have you considered zines? Because a lot of people are doing zines now too, and that's one of the things that Sean and I have been talking about is producing either a quarterly or or maybe twice a year. You know, n nothing huge, uh, yeah, but something to get work out there in print. Um, I think you have maybe a different audience because it, uh, you're selling out these collections every year. So it would seem, I mean, I don't know, but it would seem that your print, uh, audience is, is pretty loyal. Yeah. I, I've actually very much considered doing uh, a zine setup. I have a bit more of a long-term project, which I think is quite well suited for a zine format. Hmm. Um, and I don't know if I, I may have mentioned this in the past, but Basically, whenever I'm out in the field, if I find a Mylar balloon, I pick it up and then I I don't throw it away. I, I put it in a Ziploc bag and I bring it home. And so at some point, I want to photograph all these Mylar balloons in kind of a studio environment. Love it. Because um, each one of them has a story. And there's actually one I found in 2020 where a person had written all over it in a Sharpie with all their thoughts and stuff. It's hardly legible. And then they released that balloon and it ended up up at the Bristol Cones, uh, Bristol Cone Pines. Up no in, kidding. Uh, wow. In the White Mountains in California. Wow. But I, I want to photograph those and then and produce kind of a zine to raise awareness basically of they're flying trash. You know, you're right. going to end up in the wilderness. And But also that there is a story behind it. And that's something that, you know, a, a portfolio or a traditional book eh, may not be the best for. Um so that's that's a project I have in mind for a zine, um, and in terms of an actual book, I could see doing that in in another, I don't know, four or five years or so. Um, mm -hmm. Once I build up more work, but we'll see what the we'll see what everything is like at that point in time. Who knows? Maybe we'll be books will <laughs> have run their course. I, I don't know. Uh, we'll, right. we'll we'll see how how things are at that point in time. Would you shoot a new project for a book or would it be a compilation of existing work or, or maybe both? Um, I, I think it would be a comp, it'd probably be mostly a compilation of existing work. Um, and I, I don't, I don't even quite know what the theme would be. Yeah. It's a good question. I love the idea of doing zines. I mean, it's something that I, I keep coming back to and I've already done uh, a few mock-ups of what I'd like it to look like. Um, I like it because it, it's it, the barrier of entry to purchase is low for an, for an audience. Yeah. Um, the, the, the time and cost to produce is low as well. Um, so you really can use it as it's, it's not a, it's kind of a test market. It's kind of a test run. You can, you can get something out there and, and not be, you know, working on it for 18 months and have to have it printed four times and, and it's going to be $75 and you have to do a Kickstarter, can't, like all of this stuff that, that often gets associated with producing a book, a zine, you can kind of get around all of that. And to your point about advances in technology, there are a lot of printers out there that will print a zine for not a whole lot of money, even in lower yeah. print runs, 100, 150, 200 copies, they'll give you a break. and that's really attractive to me because I have no idea since I've never done anything in print, I have no idea how it's going to be received. So to be able to do it kind of as an experiment and say, look, this first run, they're going to be 200 copies or 250 copies or whatever. And, and they're going to be $12 a piece or $10 a piece, whatever it is. Um, that's a lot more attractive to me than spending three years writing another book to try and capitalize on a market that I'm not really sure of. Yeah. 
and, and there's something about the form factor of the zine that it, it, there's not a expectation of perfection like one would expect in a book where it, Absolutely. it does a lot yeah. more ex- experimentation. Yeah. And, and perhaps in some ways it's a bit like, um, I don't know, like a like Snapchat or something like that, where, you know, it's something you put out there, you know, it's not going to be something that's out there forever, like a book, you know, it's, it's something to be, um, it's to be, it's a collection of work to be consumed, to be enjoyed. But at the same time, you realize it's not going to have the same shelf life as, as a book in that regard. Yeah. Um, and there's, there might be something kind of satisfying about that where it doesn't have that same degree of permanence, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but it's something that person can, can enjoy in the moment. Um, yeah, I, I, that's definitely something I, I have gravitated towards and I've seen some really, um, some really nice zines other photographers have done. Now, the one that you're talking about doing with Sean, would that be with, with your photography or your painting or, or have, have with painting? Yeah. Uh, he's doing it. He's doing his based on individual photo projects, but I think I'm leaning toward painting and maybe integrating some of my own writing into it. I don't know. I, I'm still, yeah. I'm still unsure. One of my favorite zines, I bought one, this must've been God, four or five years ago. And it was a, a Japanese street photography zine on newsprint paper. And you, you unfolded it. It huh. was basically like a, like a newspaper and it came folded up. And it just the thing I loved about it the most was just to your point, it wasn't precious at all. It was, yeah. here's what we're doing. It's supposed to be quick. It's supposed to be gritty. It's supposed to just let you know what we're up to. This isn't a gallery presentation. This isn't, you know, something that you're going to, you know, frame and then hang on the wall. This is just meant to be this transient thing to give you an idea of what we're up to. And I kind of love that, yeah. that approach to it. Yeah. It, it's, it's something that has a defined in that, in that case, especially it's something that has a defined shelf life. Yes. You know, you're, 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 you're going to enjoy this now for in, in this moment because you know, you, you give it a, give it some time and it's, it's going to transform and uh, mm-hmm. no longer be quite what it was. Um, there's something very interesting about that. That's, yeah. that's a very, very fascinating feature. I, I like that. Yeah. I, I love it. And I, when I ordered some paper samples, there's a company in, they have one in the U S but they, the, the UK branch arm has a lot more paper choices. They're called Mixam, M I X A M and Mixam.com has, I don't know, maybe four or five paper choices, but Mixam.co.uk has more than a dozen. Uh, I mean, terrific paper choices, all in different weights. They've got recycled, they've got non-recycled, like fantastic selection of paper. And yeah. they sent me um, a couple of their uh, sample books so you can see cover stocks and interior. And here's the funny thing is it's less expensive to order from the UK, even with shipping, than ordering from their US branch. And I, I, that doesn't make any I can't, sense. I can't wrap I like my it. head around that one, Ben. I can't, yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> that makes zero sense, but yeah. I'm good with it. Yeah, I'm good with it. And, and like I say, the yeah. choice is there, you know, and, and when I ordered it, when I ordered the sample pack, they even got back to me and said, Hey, uh, we've referred you to our U S branch because you're in the U S I said, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't yeah. want the U S because you guys have more, I'll pay the shipping. I'll pay the extra fee you have better selection and I don't quite understand why there's not parity between the two, but as long as there isn't, I would prefer to order from you. And they said, okay, yeah. fine. And they sent me out the sample pack. So, so what kind of, like, how would you describe the various papers that they had? A lot of uncoated papers, which is okay. attractive to me. I don't want something, I mean, to what we've been talking about, I don't want something slick. Yeah. I don't want something that's got optical brighteners in it. That's just crisp and perfect. I, yeah. I want something that looks a little beat up, frankly. And some of their recycled papers, they're thinner. They, they're they not quite as white. They're, they're, you know, they're not gray by any means, but there's just, there's just a little, a little wear on them already. And I yeah. am really drawn to that paper stock. Um, the colors are not going to be as vibrant. And that's great because if yeah. you could get the vibrancy in print, then you wouldn't need to buy the piece. And I want you to buy the piece. <laughs> yeah. 
you know but also so, since since your 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 work is so rich with the textures and and the colors and, and all the just the really just there's so much stuff there i see how that would go really well on a recycled paper that would just kind of like especially uncoated paper just tie it together there was um back when i was going to back when i was in high school and i was applying to various colleges and stuff um i remember i i received this um this package in the mail from i don't know some place on the east coast some art school or something like that and i remember that the catalog that they had um was printed on this uncoated paper it had this it had this really nice smell to it um mm. and the, just the way that the all the stuff in that catalog looked on that paper it just worked so very well with it and most of it was you know you know painting stuff sculpture stuff they're showing examples of stuff along those lines and it and i still to this day i can remember the smell of that paper and wow. uh, and just the the feel of it so I, I think something like that would give a really nice you know tactile feel um, yeah which would which would certainly be a, a a nice part of the experience yeah i do too i i mean i think we we often discount the effect that paper stock and and ink choices and and the way images appear can can have a very visceral reaction. Um, yeah, I've got a one of Daito Moriyama's book. It's called Daito Tokyo, and the entire second half of the book is printed. Uh, his black and white photos are printed in silver ink on black paper. Wow, and man, the impact of that second half of the book is phenomenal. And it's such a different experience than flipping through the first half. It just, man, it really just, it it, it just knocked me for a loop when I saw it. Cause I, I had I'm no to, idea that I'm they were going to do it. Yeah. I'm trying to picture how that looks. That, that sounds, so they, they would basically kind of like invert the image and then print it with the silver inks on yes. the black that's yeah it almost looks like it's been screen printed like it's been screen yeah. printed in silver over black matte paper and it's gorgeous wow yeah and i bet that really ties the body of work together very well too because in that in such a a bold style like that uh, that's that's really cool i've i've never seen something done quite like that before yeah it's really neat and it's not an expensive book yeah and there's there's something about when there's a ability to experiment with materials um, like that, which just leads to such a amazing final product. Uh, I was thinking back to my, uh, when my wife was taking those bookmaking classes, um, she would always try to find ways to make projects even, she'd try to take it to another level and, mm. uh, and, and she would take it to another level. Um, so she always wanted to have a really good challenge. So uh, one of her final uh, uh, projects was a giant uh, pop-up map. So basically it opened up to the size of, I mean, larger than the typical dining room table, probably like two dining oh, wow. room tables put together. Oh, wow. And as you opened it up, it was a map of... Uh, I, I don't know if it was the entire world, but a good a good chunk of it. And as you open it up, there were these pop up tall ships. Oh, that wow. were in no the ocean. way! And it was absolutely amazing. I think she had like three pop up ships in that map. How cool! Yeah, and so and that that was the thing about that bookmaking class because it allowed for such an enormous range of of experimentation mm -hmm. and of working with the various materials and techniques. And uh, so, so, yeah, when you're talking about that book printed with the the silver ink on black, I'm just thinking of like, you know, a person looking at all the options of, of ways that one can, can do something along those lines. Right. And it definitely brought to mind some of the various projects that my, my wife did in that bookmaking class. Um, so if, if anyone's listening to this, uh, <laughs> looking at catalog right now, thinking huh, bookmaking <laughs> class, I say go for How it. How fun would it be to be a pop-up book designer? Oh yeah. That would be those, amazing. Those are the coolest. Yeah. That, I mean, I remember them from, from being a kid, but you know, I, when you're a kid, you don't give them much thought, but now you think about the engineering that went into some of those things and go, how fun would that be? as a job. Have you seen any of the 
the modern ones no. that are produced now. And and these are ones not for kids. These are just like uh, themes. There is so um, there in the reason that we have several of those is my wife bought one of the ones on on tall ships to learn how to make a ship that pops up uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. and just reverse engineer it. And so we have one on tall ships. There's one on uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, that would be cool. Um, I think there is a Star Wars one as well. So we, we have like all these various pop-up books and they're just a marvel to look at just to, cause you could see, you know, the, the person's creative process in terms of, you know, trying all kinds of ways to achieve these massive things that pop out of these books, right. and all the movement, right. It, it takes a whole nother level of thinking. So if, if you ever happen to uh, to come across one of those, I, I highly recommend it. There, there, there's one company in particular, one author or whatever in particular that really specializes in that now. But they're they're fantastic to look at. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and again, I mean, the care that goes into them. What a lovely job that would be. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm feeling that whoever it is that designs those, they don't like go to work each day going, ah, oh, man, <laughs> what a bummer. I have to design a pop-up book today. I'm making a pop-up book today again. <laughs> <laughs> Said no one ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those jobs that uh, you know, there probably aren't, you know, many of them I would imagine. Yeah. But I, I would, I would guess that the people that do it absolutely love it. Yeah, for sure. Subscribe in your favorite podcast app, and you can support the show by leaving a review or a rating wherever you listen, or by sharing the episode on social media. You can help support everything I do directly by tapping the donate button at jeffreysadoris.com. That's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S.com. And thank you so much to those of you who have done just that. I really do appreciate it. You can connect with Ben on Twitter and Instagram at Ben Horn. That's B-E-N-H-O-R-N-E on his website at benhorn.com or by searching for Ben Horn on YouTube. At the time of this recording, he's got less than 60 copies left of his 2022 print portfolio, and they do sell out every year. So if you would like to pick up one for yourself, you might want to visit his site sooner than later. Connect with me on Twitter and Instagram at Jeffrey Sidoris, or you can send an email or a voice message directly to the show at deepnatter at gmail.com. As always, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate it, and I hope you'll come back for the next one.